And what Francis really focused on was verse 3, remembering. And I think that's a key word here, remembering. Because one day, if the Lord tarries his return, which we'll talk about next week, the return of Christ, and no, I'm not predicting the return of Christ. But I can tell, I can make this prediction. It's going to be soon. Now, soon could be tomorrow. Soon could be five years. Soon could be 100 years. <laughs> so soon. It's going to be soon-ish. Um, but what he focused on was verse 3. It says, remembering, and the Lord tarries his return, we won't always be with each other. And what we're going to think about is, what do I remember about said person? How do I remember them? And Paul, if you remember, these are Christians who Paul only spent less than, less than a month with. Read Acts 17 for further understanding. Acts 17 provides the context to this book. Where Paul started this church in three weeks, basically. Within three weeks, he taught them the word of God. And it wasn't perfect conditions. In fact, when they came to faith in Christ, they were being persecuted. Now, we don't face the persecution they face. You know, when they were persecuted, there was a guy named Jason, read Acts 17 to learn more about him, who was actually dragged out of his house. You know what I'm talking about? A few years ago, when I say a few years ago, it's probably 15 years ago. There was this couple in southern Philippines, Mindanao. And they were there as uh, missionaries. Last name is Burns. And in the middle of the night, as they served the people in the Philippines in this terrorist region of Mindanao, this military terrorist group came and kidnapped them in the middle of the night. Can you imagine with me, if you are asleep, you are sound asleep, and all of a sudden you hear a noise and you think, and you know the, the wife says, "Honey, I heard a noise." And you go, "Oh, honey, it's okay. It's just the dog, or it's just the animals." But this time she goes, "I heard a noise. I heard footsteps." And you're like, eh, "Footsteps!" And you get up, and all of a sudden the people are grabbing you violently, taking you out of the house, and beating you in the middle of the night. Praise your Burnham. Look it up. Her husband was killed. As, as she was being freed, as the help was coming, her husband was killed in the process. The middle of the night, persecution happened. And for these believers who just got saved probably a month ago, they were taught so much by the Apostle Paul. And among an environment where they were being persecuted, they stayed strong in the Lord. How do we know that? Because if you read 1 Thessalonians 3, Paul says, we sent Timothy back to see how you were doing, and he reported a good report, that you were doing well. You were still standing strong on the doctrines that we taught you. You were still living for Jesus. We're going to talk more about that next week. Notice he says how he remembers them in verse 3. Remembering before our God and Father. So not just remembering, oh, I'm reminiscing about the good old times. No. He was remembering them before God, saying, God, I thank you for those believers in Thessalonica. And for what? Their work of faith. You know their work of faith? You know what Paul is doing? He's looking back at their salvation. He's looking back at their salvation. You know, very interestingly, Paul and James, the book of James, are accused of being against each other. The book of Romans and the book of James, you got theologians who say Paul and James contradict each other. And usually Paul would say faith is always justified before Almighty God. But notice he says here, your work of faith. We're going to talk more about that next week. You're going to see a correlation from the text next week to the word work of faith. You know what that means? Someone says uh, works that doesn't give you faith or works doesn't save, but faith that saves works. You understand what I'm saying? Works doesn't save, but faith works. The faith in Christ has saved you works. And that's what Paul is talking about. The work of faith, looking back. Then he says the labor or the agonizing or the, the manual physical labor of love. 
he uses the trilogy or the trinity, I should say, of the virtues of the Christian life. Faith, hope, and love. The trinity of the Christian life of virtues. Faith, hope, and love. And he remembers that before God. He looked back and says, I remember your work of faith. We're going to talk more about that next week. Because let me tell you, they didn't come to faith in Christ under easy con uh, uh, conditions. Then he said, your labor of love. How they loved God. They loved one another. They loved Paul. And Paul loved them. Thus the letter we have. And then finally, he says, your, 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 your patience, your steadfastness of hope. We're going to talk about that again next week. As they were patiently waiting for the coming of the Lord. Are you waiting for the coming of the Lord, church? So many Christians are so wrapped up in the busyness of life that they forget that Jesus is coming. That's not a that's not a that's not a Harry Potter series. That's not a Lord of the Rings fictional, you know, add-on. That's not something that's fake or something that's imagined. It was true that in the Old Testament they portrayed or they prophesied, I should say, actually, a better word. They prophesied of the coming of the Lord the first time. The Bible in the New Testament prophesies of the coming of the Lord the second time. And there's two different types of return we're going to talk about this week. The coming in the air for his people and the coming back to earth. Those are two different returns. One's in later in this book, 1 Thessalonians 4, the coming back for his people. And one is in Revelation 19, the coming back to earth. Those are two different returns set by several years apart. And we're going to talk about that. But the believers in Thessalonica heard about the doctrine. Get this. The Apostle Paul had the gall. Most churches today treat new believers as babies, and they are babies in Christ. Are they not? So when you are a baby, you don't feed babies steak. What do you feed them? Anything else? Baby food. Milk. Baby food. Anything that's liquid. Something that their stomach can digest easier than solid food. But very interesting, less than four weeks, less than a month, Paul taught these believers the big doctrines of the Bible. He taught them of Christ, Christology. He taught them of the work of God which is called, uh, well, theology as a whole. He taught them of eschatology, the study of end times. He taught them of the church ecclesiology. He taught them so much about the ologies, we would say, the study of these different aspects of God and his word. And yet we're telling people, you know what? If you could just read the Bible for two minutes a day, that would help. It's not enough, church, to say I'm saved. It's not enough to know that heaven is your home. You know what's more important than just saying heaven is my home? Actually living like heaven is your home. You don't believe me? Read Colossians 3. If you have been risen with Christ, Paul says in Colossians 3.1, so set your mind on what? Things above. And then he goes through a laundry list. Of how we who are risen with Christ and our life is in it with Christ. And every spiritual blessing that God has for us in heaven is ours now as it were. He goes through a laundry list of how we ought to live before people. Whether you're a husband, whether you're a wife. Whether you have a, a, a job as it were over people. Or you are a servant uh, under those uh, masters. He tells you how to live, and then he concludes it all by saying, whatever you do in Colossians 3.23, do all to the glory of Christ, for it is Christ that you serve. So when you go to work tomorrow, and you go to work and you're tired, remembering you are representing Christ. So everyone says, I hate Mondays because i got to go back to work. Can we say thank God for Mondays because I get to put into action what I learned on Sunday? I remember when I used to work in a factory and have to unload the trucks. And I used to be so cold because in the truck in the middle of the winter in Chicago, believe me, it was cold and hot. Well, what do I mean cold? Can you imagine negative 15 degrees Celsius? And I used to work in that truck unloading these boxes. And I remember going to work so tired because I worked at 6 o'clock in the morning. 
And all of a sudden, God got a hold of my heart through his word. It was like, you are representing me. So how you display yourself is a representative of mine. Therefore, go to work. You don't have to have a smile on your face. Come on. Who wants to wake up at 6 o'clock in the morning and have to be so cold and you got to unload this all of But what you did, it changed how you worked. It changed how I worked. I didn't work for my boss anymore. I worked for Christ. And so I did my job as if I was doing it for Christ, who's ultimately my boss. And all of a sudden, my supervisor started seeing I was working different. You see that? See, I don't just say I, I have faith in Christ. My life showed it. I didn't go around saying, hey, guys, I'm working different. See me working different for Jesus. No, I just did it. And my boss said, Ping, what's happened to you? I said, oh, I came up with some superficial answer. The reality is in my heart, I knew I was now working for the Lord Jesus. And I did my job better because I did it as unto the Lord. The work of love. Francis called it the work of faith. And then he said the work of hope. I was reading this week a lot about hope. I was watching a movie, I can't remember what it was, and it, was, it said this. Don't take away people's hope. Hope sometimes is all people have. Pending your circumstances. And the Christian life is one of hope. The Christian life is one of faith. But one day when we stand before Christ, we no longer need faith. We no longer need hope. Because the greatest of these trinity of virtues is love of which we will always display before Almighty God. Church, are you still with me? Amen. Let's be upstanding for the rereading of Scripture that Tia read. I'm going to actually read from verse 4 to the end of the chapter. As we're going to see, genuine Christianity. Genuine Christianity. Look at verse 4. For we know the brothers, or brethren, my fellow believers, loved by God, that he has chosen you or elected you. Because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we were, we proved to be among you for your sake. Verse 6. And you became imitators or followers of us and of the Lord, for you received the word and much affliction or persecution with the joy of the Holy Spirit. I'll read that again. For you receive the word in much affliction with what? The joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers, all the Christ followers, all the Christians in Macedonia and in Achaia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere so that we need not say anything, verse 9, for they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you what? Turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and here it is, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from what? From the wrath to come. Let's pray. Now, God, as we read your word, I pray for the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit, that he would open our eyes so that we may behold wondrous things out of your word. Oh, that Jesus would be magnified and exalted to the glory of you, God. For you so loved the world that you gave your only begotten Son. May our lives be transformed now because we are spending time in the text. In the name of Jesus, amen. 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 Um, you may be seated. Genuine is a very interesting word, is it not? We don't often use this word, but whenever we use it, word, it has a clear picture of what, 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 what is being talked about. If I say something is genuine, I am implying that what I'm saying is genuine is not what? Fake. So if I say that, uh, I remember somebody looked at my wife's ring and I couldn't afford a, a 
thousand dollar ring or two thousand dollar ring. And so they looked at my wife's ring, knowing I couldn't afford the ring, and my wife's ring had a diamond on it. So guess what they did? They looked at it. Is that real? Is that genuine? They know I couldn't afford a, a ring that looked like that. So is that a real diamond or ring? And do you know what the Bible kind of talks about with our faith? Is that when our faith is tested, people are going to look at you, are you a real Christian? You see, there are Christians, there are those who follow Christ in obedience to Christ, who are living according to the word of Christ. Then there's believers in Christ who are saved, but they're desiring the things of this world, but they also want heaven as their home. And there's that constant struggle of the flesh and the Holy Spirit who abides in us. Though they're saved, there's a wrestling with the flesh and the world and the temptations of the devil. And then there's some who are mature in Christ, who are spiritual, I would say godly, who are, who are, who don't who are not perfect, by the way, but they don't wrestle with the temptations as they used to. Maybe there's different temptations. Maybe there's different struggles that they have to overcome and have victory over. But at the end of the day, we all struggle with something or some things in our lives pertaining to the flesh, the world, and the temptations of the devil. So when people look at your life, the question must be asked, as I've said before here, if you were taken to court and you were put on the stand, is there enough evidence in your life to convict you of being a Christian? Is there enough evidence in your life to convict you of being a Christ follower? That is what is on our life every day. Is people are putting us on the stand and expecting us to be perfect, and there is no such thing as a perfect Christian. But what they're expecting of us is to say, would you practice what you preach? If God is love, how should we treat people? If God is kind, how should we treat people? If God is forgiving, how should we treat people? If God is gracious, how should we treat people? Doesn't mean we don't stand for truth. Yes, you bet your bottom dollar. You stand for the truth of God's word. You stand for God. You stand firm in the truth of God. You do not compromise the word of God. But you allow the word of God to penetrate your heart, to affect your mind. So when you speak, you're speaking as it were the words of life. And what I'm going to declare to you is eight marks of Christianity. Genuine Christianity. Not no human version of Christianity, not the Christianity of the mind, the Christianity of the will, the Christianity of Calvinism, the Christianity of Arminianism, the Christianity of, of Catholicism, the Christianity of Anglican Church. I'm giving you biblical Christianity, genuine Christianity. That's what I'm going to give you this morning and next week. There's eight marks from this text that we're, we're going to see for today and for, for next week. And, and, uh, oh, but by the way, Paul, remember, started here. Worked his way up to here. He was released by the church being sent out by the Holy Spirit. He and Barnabas, on the first missionary journey, they went here. Here he gathered a young man named Timothy and also the doctor Luke. And Luke, who wrote the book of Luke and the book of Acts in the Bible, he journeys with him to here. And remember here, where is it? Uh, here, he received a vision in the middle of the night, someone saying, Come over here to help us. It was a man in the vision. It turned out to be a uh, woman named Lydia in Philippi. This is Macedonia, what we call today Greece. This is Turkey. This is Syria. This is Israel. This is Africa down here. So this is Europe. So when Paul says that their testimony in Thessalonica, which is here, went throughout Macedonia, he's saying all of Europe knows about you. <laughs> By the way, no Snapchat. <laughs> no Instagram, no website, no Facebook, no way of putting out with images. <laughs> These people are changed. Hallelujah. So how did they hear about it? You know what they did? When people went to Thessalonica and, the, and they, they encountered the Christians, they went back to where they were from and said, I've got to tell you about those Christians in Thessalonica. You know how we can break that down to us? If people were to come down to Laurel Hunt and meet people from Bible Center, what would they say about us? 
What they say up in Auckland, I got to tell you about those Christians at Bible Center. Man, they are on fire for God. The Holy Spirit is turning the, that church up. Right side up, not upside down. And Jesus is loved among those people. And the Bible, and the people are devoting themselves to the study of the Bible and to fellowship and to prayer. And they are serious about making disciples. They are serious about telling people about Jesus. Would that be our testimony? Well, that was the testimony of a church that was started less than a month. Come on, church. This church was started less than a month, and that was their testimony. Oh, by the way. Paul left. Oh, they had the Apostle Paul. No, they didn't. They had him for less than a month. Three weeks. Oh, they must have had Timothy. No, he went with Paul. Oh, they must have had uh, uh, Silas. No, he went with Paul. So what did they have? They had this. Folks, if you got the Bible, if you got the Holy Spirit, because he abides in you, because you are saved by the Son of God, that's all you need. This is a blessing. The church is God's blessing to the, to, to the world, as it were. We need the church, do we not? We need the church. I need the church. As pastor, I need the church. The church needs me. How do I know that? I'm not trying to be arrogant. But the church needs me. Why? Because Ephesians 4 says when Christ ascended, he gave gifts to the church. He gave some apostles, some prophets, foundation of the church. Then he gave evangelists or missionaries and pastor teachers, gifts to the church. You know that the missionaries and the pastors are gifts of church from Christ. That's not me reading Ephesians chapter 4 verse 12. When Christ went back to heaven, as it were, as a conquering hero, and in the time of the Romans, whenever a Roman uh, a general would win a victory, he would give gifts to those who were behind him. Gifts to those he left behind. As it were to say, look at what I've done for you. When Christ went back to heaven, conquering death and sin, he gave gifts to the church, evangelists, pastor teachers, apostles, and prophets. Foundational, Ephesians 2.20 tells us that apostles and prophets were foundational to the beginning of the church. There are no more apostles, there are no more prophets. Hear me clearly, church. No more apostles. I don't care who calls themselves an apostle. No more apostles of Christ. No more prophets of Christ because they were foundational to the church of Christ. The church of Christ is built upon them with what? Evangelists and pastor teachers and baptized believers and people who are getting saved. And ultimately, the church is built upon disciples of Christ. So these people in here, by the way, Thessalonica, 200,000 populated city. 200,000. When you study history, it tells us that it was a, a major Roman colony. And you can see it's, it's on a port. So whenever people come through the Aegean city, I mean sea, they have to stop in Thessalonica. And it was a city full of pagan gods. I believe the Aphrodite temple was there. And so the Greek and Roman gods were worshipped continually. These believers were saved out of that. We're going to do, we read it, how you turn to God from idols. Their lives were centered around the worship of idols. And now because of Paul and the message that Paul proclaimed with Silas and with Timothy, now their lives are changed, a change of direction. And when you turn this way, your back automatically faces against that, whatever's behind you. That is genuine repentance. Whenever you turn to Christ, you automatically are turned against something. And that's these believers in Thessalonica. So when we talk about marks of genuine Christianity, here they are. Here's all eight marks. And I provided the verses so you can see I'm not taking it out of context. Please read those verses. We're going to see some of them today. You can see it next week. I'm providing you. So next week, it really doesn't need to come because I'm giving you the sermon. <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> it's like, oh, on Sunday morning, I get to sleep in because he already gave us the sermon points. No. But here it is. A relationship with God. Marks of genuine, genuine Christianity. starts with this. Relationship with God. Received by God. I was looking for a word for chosen. There is no synonym with chosen. So I was trying to stick with the letter R. So received by God. Received, genuine Christianity received God's word, respects, 
or respect for God's servant, reflection or imitators of Christ, representative or examples as Christians, repentance towards God, and we are readily looking for Jesus' return. Um, amen? amen? Right there. There's a sermon. But don't leave yet. As people, what do you call it, on midnight, and they have these ads on TV, and they show you a, a great deal, and they'll say, always this, but wait. There's more. There's more. The first mark we're going to see, and I'm just going to kind of speed through a couple of these, is a relationship with God. A relationship with God. Turn with me to John chapter 1. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. If you don't have a Bible, there's some on the back table. If you still need a Bible, let Chad know. Chad is up here in the front with the left back hoodie. John chapter 1. But to all who received him, who what? Believed in his name. John chapter 1 verse 12. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, the right what? He gave the right to become what? Children of God. You see that? John chapter 1. Children of God. A relationship with God. You want to have a genuine, a real Christianity, it starts with a relationship with God. As you can see, I wrote, while God's love is the basis for salvation. What did Paul say right in these believers? He, he says it, for we know. That's very interesting. I often tell people, I cannot know that you're saved. Only you know that you're saved. But the reality is this. The scripture says two times in all of the New Testament, you shall know them by their fruit. Once, he says, of false teachers. The other, he says, the scripture speaks of Christians. You shall know them by their fruit. So how you live shows people whether you're saved. Now you're saying, Pastor, I can't live perfectly. You're, you're absolutely right. But here's the question. Has your life been changed? Has your life been changed? What do I mean? In 1 John, John is writing the believers, and my pastor who is now home with the Lord, he used to always quote this verse to me. He says, Pink, I know I'm saved because I love you. And I was like, what? That's a very interesting. And it's like, Vaughn, I know I'm saved because I love you. And it's like, can you explain that more? He says, because my pastor was, um, was uh, well, again, he's home with the Lord. So he was a uh, Fatia, European, a uh, 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 descent. He, he comes from the country area of America, and he comes to the inner city of Chicago, and he's ministering to Hispanics and blacks. And the Bible says, and where he ministered was an area not far from where the type of area I grew up. I grew up in a rough area. People in South Auckland who live in Otara think they live in a rough area. It doesn't compare. I, I'm speaking honest. I'm speaking honest. And I told my mate, Pastor Cliff, who grew up really rough, who grew up really rough, but rough is subjective to your understanding. Like, I thought I grew up rough, and then I went to Mexico, and I saw people living in mud huts who didn't have much, and they had to sit on the toilet and... Don't get me started. <laughs> I thought I had it rough because I heard the gunshots and I was surrounded by the street life and prostitution and people being killed. And you hear stories every day. Do you hear somebody got shot last night? And you know what? You know, anyone with common sense would say, I'm going to stay away from that life. But for me, being hard headed, I said, oh, that's attractive. And very interestingly, real quick, it seemed that girls love roughnecks. <laughs> In fact, there's a song about that. Long ago, you know. And so growing up, I wanted to appease the girls. And so to appease the girls, there were a lot of girls who wanted bad boys. And I say, something's wrong with these girls now. Something's wrong with these girls. They want a bad boy. And it was a good thing that this bad boy got shot. A good thing that this bad boy got stabbed. A good thing that this bad boy spent time in prison. Oh, I love that. I'm sorry. He loves me. And you're just like, what is wrong with you? But that's what they loved. And so you give yourself to that image. That was my environment. I thought I had it rough. 
But in Otaro, they had it wrong. You watch a movie called Once Were Warriors. It was different. But I didn't, how I live doesn't compare to what these guys had to go through. How we live here don't compare to what the people of Israel is going through right now. The whole Middle Eastern war, by the way, is still happening. The war between Ukraine and Russia is still happening. We're just ignorant of it because we don't see it. And we only see what the media portrays. Unless you just want to do a deep dive into these things. We just kind of forget about it because it's not as once trending or popular of the news as it once was. But guess what? There are people in real life, real time, as we stand here, as we sit here in the peace of this room, in the peace of this building, who are threatened with bombs. And yet there are Christians still standing strong. My pastor said, Pink, I know I'm saved because I love you. You want to know why? Because the Bible says, you know you have passed from death to life when you have love for your brethren. You know you have passed from death and enmity with God, under God's wrath, to life, life eternal with God, and the peace that, with God that you have, the salvation in Christ, when you have love for your brethren. You know what Paul says? I know that you were chosen by God. And he first calls them beloved. In the Greek, it is literally this. He says, for we know, we're brothers, beloved of God. Literally, he says, the beloved of God. That's what Paul says to him. I know you're the beloved of God. And I would love to say to my fellow believers in this room, I know the beloved of God, that God chose you, which leads to our second point, that we were chosen by God. And I, well, that, that should say, uh, re received by God. Received by God. Received by God. He says, I know, beloved of God, that he has what? Chosen you. The word chosen is the word elected. And that word has scared too many Christians. Since the, 1500, since the 1500s or the 16th century, a dominant part of Christianity rose called Reformed Theology. A guy named Martin Luther, a guy named John Calvin, a guy named Zwingli, they all popularized a teaching that salvation is of God. And by the way, they didn't make that up. That's of, that's of the Bible. Salvation is of God. In fact, you can see George Whitfield, who said true conversion means turning not only from sin, but also from depending on self-made righteousness. I heard the ladies talk about something similar yesterday. True conversion in Christ, receiving salvation, means turning not only from sin, but also from depending on self-made righteousness. Those who trust in their own righteousness for conversion hide behind their own good works. George Whitfield, who was also a Calvinist, a follower of the teachings of John Calvin, in Reformed theology, who had a powerful voice. He preached so loudly without a microphone, he could be heard miles away. So for a long time, centuries of theology teaching has one on this side, one on this side. Salvation is of God, salvation is of man. I want to give you a balanced view of salvation. I want to give you a balanced view of your salvation in Christ. Salvation of the believer. Listen to this. I didn't put it up. But the salvation of the believer is of God. That's clear. Salvation of the believer is of God. For God so loved the world. For Romans 5 8. But God demonstrated his love toward us. That while we were yet sinners, what? Christ died for us. It's God who initiated salvation. We never asked for salvation to be initiated. We never asked for salvation. Romans 3 says, for there's none good, no, not one. None who seeks after God. We never asked for God to save us from the penalty of sin. And he did this before the universe was created. Ephesians chapter 1 for further understanding. We never asked for it. God, who is omniscient, who knows all things, knew by the, his foreknowledge that 
Who would be saved? Who would not be saved? That's the foreknowledge of God. God knows all things. I'm giving you the Bible. I'm not giving you Calvinism. I'm giving you the Bible right now. God knows all things. He knows who are going to be saved. It's not, it doesn't escape his knowledge who gets saved, who doesn't get saved. But listen, salvation of the believers of God is planned by God, is provided by God, is carried out by God, and it is kept by God. Listen to that again. Salvation of the believer is of God. That salvation is planned by God, provided by God, carried out by God, and kept by God. You don't believe me? The verses I've been quoting for ages now, and I just said it again a few minutes ago, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave or sacrificed his only begotten son, that whoever would believe in him, that's our response to the gospel, would not perish but have eternal life. Who gives the believer eternal life? God. Who keeps the believer with that eternal life? God. Who provides the believer with eternal life? God. Who planned the eternal life for the believer? God. When did you plan your salvation? Did you even plan to be born? Did you plan what, what country you're going to live in? Did you plan your ethnicity? Did you plan your skin color? Did you plan your eye color? Did you plan how much you're going to weigh at a certain age? <laughs> well, maybe that one. <laughs> maybe I'll give you that one. By 50 years old, I'm going to weigh 90 kgs. If, you know, <laughs> maybe you can plan that one. You didn't give yourself salvation. Therefore, you cannot lose your salvation that God has given you. You understand? Yeah. So when God gives you salvation, you cannot lose it because you are kept by the power of God. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 5. But here's the other side of the coin. I'm going to show you a picture soon of what I'm talking about. Salvation is of God. That's God's perspective. That's God's how he sees it. You don't see all what God sees. Read Ephesians 1. You don't see all of that. What we see is this side of the thing. We are on heaven. I mean, we're on earth side. God sees heaven and earth. So, salvation of the believer is of God. This is the balanced view. This is not John Calvin, Arminian. This is, this is the right down the middle. The balanced view. Salvation of the believer is of God. Planned by God, provided by God, carried out by God, and kept by God. But sinners... Jesus says in Luke 19, verse 10, I came to seek the lost. And no one gets saved until they realize that they're lost. That's why it was popular with Spurgeon and many others who, would, when they speak of the gospel, they always started with, do you realize that you're a sinner before a holy God? Too many people think their good work saves them. It doesn't. It actually sends you closer to hell, I would say. Because you think you're on the way to heaven when in reality, by doing all these good works, it don't matter who you are, by doing all these good things, you think it's getting you closer to God. In reality, it's putting you further from God. Because Jesus paid it all. As a hymn writer said, all to him I owe. Sinners are responsible to respond with faith. Sinners are responsible to respond with faith, trusting in the Lord Jesus for their eternal life. You see this part? While well, God's love is the basis or the foundation for our salvation, we're not saved by God's love. We're saved by what? God's grace. This is my quote, by the way. This is my quote. I didn't put my name there. So, hey, you put that on here, man. But this is, this is, this is me. No other scripture is to say God's love saves us. God's love is the basis for our salvation. For God so loved the world that he what? Sacrificed. That's God's grace. God's grace results in God's love. You understand that, church? You got to get that. God's grace is the enablement for our salvation. So when the sinners before a holy God, doesn't matter how, how much you are how you compare yourself to other people. Sinners before a holy God hear the truth of the gospel 
It pierces their heart through the work of the Holy Spirit. And they believe in the name of the one who loved them and gave himself for them. Now that leads to salvation. See? So that's the balanced view of being received by God. Received by God. The third league. Oh, here it is right here. Here's the picture. So here's us. Look at me. Is that me right there? Take off that hair. You know. I mean, this is me and TK with hair. So on this side of, as it were, this is our viewpoint. Imagine this is heaven's gate. On this side, whosoever will, anybody, come. Come to Jesus. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. And what? I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. People may put heavy yokes upon you. Jesus says, take my yoke upon you. It's free. It's free. Receive me as your Lord and Savior. Whosoever will. You mean Jesus? All those people who are killing the lives of other people, they can come to Jesus? Yes, they can. You mean Jesus? All these rapists of children, can they come? Yes, they can. You mean Jesus? All these CEOs who are robbing people? Yes, they can. Anyone can come to Jesus. But they have to come to Jesus on Jesus' terms. You understand? You don't come to Jesus on your terms. Oh, I wish I had time, church. Oh, I, oh. The terms we come up with. I met someone who said, I, I made a deal with God. And I told God he can be God and I can be me. And that's my deal with God. I said, oh, you made a, a deal with the wrong God. Because there is a God of this world who is fully okay with that deal. You know who I'm talking about? His name is Satan. He's all okay with you being you, which is going to send you to hell with him. You don't come to Jesus on your terms. You come to Jesus on his terms. And his term is this. You come to me, all who are weary and elated. You realize that you're a sinner before me. And you realize that apart from me, you can do nothing. And you realize that if you die in your sins, you are under my wrath. And you will spend eternity under my wrath in a real place called hell. And you realize that once you die apart from me and away from me, you spend eternity away from my presence. And you realize you never get another chance after you die. So today is the day of salvation. And when you realize that I'm a sinner before this holy Savior, what must I do to be saved? That's Jesus' turn. So whoever will will come. You walk through the gate. You look back. The Bible says this. You were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. Reconcile those two, church. <laughs> there it is. John 3.16. Anyone. For whosoever believes in Jesus, you go to the other side, has been chosen before the foundation of the world. Don't let theology by certain people confuse you of what is very simple that even a child can receive salvation. If you hear the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, you believe in Jesus Christ, you will be saved. That's being received by God. Ephesians 1 says, Christians were chosen before the foundation of the earth. And they were saved, they were saved in Christ when they heard the message of the truth, and they believed. God set them apart. He called them. He chose them. He elected them. Don't let that big word chosen or election confuse you. God chose you before you were born. But you were saved when you believed. Thirdly, these believers in Thessalonica received God's word. Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 1. As you turn there to 1 Peter, it's at the end of the New Testament. Oh, i got to quit soon. Oh, I'm going to leave the next one, the respect for God's servant. I'm going to leave that to next week because I want to finish soon. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1 towards the end of the New Testament. As you turn there, listen to what Paul said to these believers. For we know, brothers, beloved of God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power, in the Holy Spirit, and with full conviction. 1 Peter 1, verse 23 says these words. 1 Peter 1, 
chapter 1, verse 23. Having purified, in verse 22, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love. Love one another earnestly from a pure heart since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding what? Word of God. No one is saved apart from hearing the word of God. Whoa, that's a big topic, isn't it? Wait, Pastor. Not everybody hears the word of God. Not everybody hears the gospel. There are part people in the world who never heard of Jesus. What about them? Talk to me after service if you really want to know. Where do they go? To hell. Why? Because God said so. Wait a minute. You can't say that, Pastor. I just did. Wait, that's unloving. That's not my, my, my decision. It's God's decision. Not to send them to hell. No. 2 Peter 3, 9. But God is not willing that any should perish. But that all would come to repentance. So God doesn't send people to hell. No. Who sends people to hell? Themselves. Well, how, how can they send themselves to hell? Because they don't believe in Jesus. But what if they never heard of Jesus? Talk to me after the service. These believers received God's word. He said, you not only heard the word. What we spoke to you was not mere words. Look at the First Thessalonians one again, and you be and became because our gospel came to you not only in word. And by the way, he's not talking miraculous gifts here of the apostles. He's nothing. He's not talking anything miraculous. All he is saying is this: we spoke, and the Holy Spirit powerfully worked. Simple. How did the Holy Spirit powerfully work? Because they heard the word of God. Too many people fill the chairs and pews of churches and their mind is far from God while they're sitting in the service hearing the word of God. I was one of those people. I remember listening to the pastor preaching the word of God, the unadulterated message of God's word, and my mind was on lunch. My mind was on the girl in the first row. My mind was on everything but God. You know what I'm talking about. The reality is I can't force you to listen to God's word. Just as much as we can force little children to sit still. We can sit them down. Sit them there. You be quiet. We can threaten them. If you don't be quiet, I'm going to take away your allowance. I'm going to take away this. I'm going to take... And what's going to happen? They, they may do it for a short time. Just because they want what you are offering them. But in their heart, it's far from God. In fact, there's a book called Already Gone. It's a scary book written by a guy named Ken Ham. Ken Ham, who was used by God to rebuild the Ark of Noah over in Kentucky in the USA. There's actually a bit. We went there, and it is huge. <laughs> they built it according to the dimensions of the Bible. That boat is huge. And I mean, when you're, you feel small. You feel real small. And Eileen, you will feel even smaller. <laughs> I hate to pick on Eileen, but I was just looking at Eileen. And if, if I feel small, Eileen, I'm sorry. You know? <laughs> Anyways, for time's sake. Ken Ham wrote a book called Already Gone. You know what in the book it talks about? It's scary that most young people who fill our chairs, most young adults who fill our chairs, they're, gone. they're there because they're because their parents force them. They don't want to be there. And as soon as they have the opportunity to choose whether they're going to come, they're gone. They're ready. The, the book title already gone, and they try to present a lot of statistics. You shouldn't have children's ministry. You shouldn't have youth ministry because all that does is entertain them. Here at Bible Center, we don't entertain your kids the entire time. We teach them from God's holy text. We teach them from the Bible. We teach them with videos. We teach them through whatever by whatever means we can because we want them to go away knowing more about God. But there's a lot of churches that entertain our kids and our teenagers and our young adults for 45 minutes. And I remember a child who was invited to our church. And when my daughter Israela said to them, oh, what do you do there? Well, we sing and we, we fellowship and then we sit down for 30 minutes or so to learn God's word. And that young person said to Israela, nah, I am not going to your church 
Because in my church, we get to actually just sing songs of the world. We get to do this. We get to do that. All, all kind of things for 45 minutes. And then the, the speaker gets up for five, five minutes. I said, that may it never be a Bible center where we minimize time with God to appease people. You want to be a peace? Go to the movie theater. You want to be entertained? Watch Netflix. But when you come to church, it better be to worship God Almighty according to his holy text. That's how God wants us to come. To worship him in spirit and in truth. Whatever impact the preaching of the word has upon a person's heart is the powerful working of the Holy Spirit. Is that there? There it is. That's me again, by the way. Whatever impact the preaching of the word has upon a person's heart is the powerful working of the Holy Spirit. I remember so many times people said, Pastor, you were talking directly to me. I said, I, I was talking directly to that wall. <laughs> it's the Holy Spirit who's talking to you through his word. Yes. I'm talking to an open air, as it were. Some preachers look at that. That way, so, you, know, you know, ultimately, I, I stand before Almighty God delivering the holy text of God. Whatever impact God's word has upon your heart is coming from the Holy Spirit of God. And the question is this, and then with this I'll close because of time's sake. Will you be obedient to God? Will you be obedient? Let's pray. With every head bowed, I just want to give you time to pause and pray. Maybe you're here and you're saying, I need to do business with God. I, first, I need to get saved. I don't know the Lord Jesus as my Savior. I've been depending on my on the, the religion I grew up in. I've been depending on the church. I've been depending on my parents. I've been depending on... You, this morning, you can depend upon God for your salvation. Depend only on God for your salvation. If you're here and you, know, you don't know Jesus Christ, you have not received him as Lord and Savior, please talk to me afterwards. I would love to open God's holy text, his holy word, the Bible, and show you how to be made right with God for all eternity. If you're here and you're struggling, it's easy to put on a show for other people. It's easy to put on the... the Christian behavior in front of other people, but in your heart you know you're struggling with doubt, you're struggling with sin, you're struggling with the world, you're struggling with so many things, and yet you're here, and I thank you for being here. But if you're struggling, would you just surrender that at the foot of the cross? And just say, Lord God, help me. That's simple. Lord God, de deliver me from this anxiety, from this de depression, from this sin. You do know the sin that you're struggling with. Lord, help me to cast all my cares upon you, for you care for me, this, this scripture says. And if you're here and you're walking with Christ, can I encourage you to keep walking with Christ? How do you walk with Christ? By spending time in his word, by being obedient to his word, because you love the God of the word. Would you continue to do that? But as you continue to do that, expect persecution to come. Expect trials to come. Expect suffering to come. Why? Because Jesus himself suffered. Out of obedience to the Father. Because he left heaven, the glory of heaven to come to earth. He took on the likeness of a man and he suffered a cruel death, even the death of a cross. So that we who believe in him would receive eternal life. So we who are walking with him would know and we can expect that if he suffered, we would suffer. For Paul told Timothy, all who desire to live godly will be persecuted. So if you're walking with Jesus, keep on doing that. Even in the midst of the fire, God is with us. That through it all. My eyes are upon uh, Jesus, you can say. So, Lord God, we surrender all of this into your hands, and we trust you for your unfailing work in our lives to the glory of Jesus. In his name we give thanks and pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.